Well, thank you, Stephen, and good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to be considering the importance of knowing and understanding that the nation of Israel in the earth today, according to Bible truth, are God's chosen people. Unfortunately, there are several religious communities that strongly advocate that God is not involved with the Jews any longer, that he has abandoned them because of what they did to his son, and that instead he has chosen the Christians as his chosen people who are now his witnesses in the earth. Well, as Christadelphians, we firmly believe that the Bible is clear. God chose Israel as his special people, and that their existence in the world today is evidence that he has not abandoned them, in spite of their refusal to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah 2,000 years ago. The reason we can be sure of this is because the Bible plainly teaches that God chose that nation to be his people, and it tells us why he did, so that we might understand that he has a purpose with the people that involves all, human all humanity. So in the chapter that we read from tonight, the, re the reasons why God chose Israel are given. In verse 6, Moses, who led Israel out of Egypt 40 years earlier from the time of this chapter, makes it clear to the nation that they were chosen by God. We read, For thou, Israel, art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Notice the emphasis in this verse and the three words that make it clear that the nation of Israel was singled out by God to be his people. Firstly, thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The word holy in the Old Testament Hebrew means separated. God separated the nation of Israel from all other nations in the earth. That setting apart was to be a two-way thing. God set them apart from all other nations and he expected them to adopt his separate way of worship. If you have a King James version of the Bible in front of you, you'll notice the heading at the top of the page, which is a comment from the publishers summarizing the verses on the page, that Israel were to understand that all communion with the nations was forbidden. The nation of Israel was set apart with laws from God. They were not to practice or follow the religion of other nations who were involved with idolatry. The second emphasis we read in verse 6 is, God hath chosen thee, Israel, to be a special people. The word chosen means to select and appoint. Again, there is a purpose behind this selection. It is so that they might be special to God. The word special there means to be a treasure, jewels. They were to become a nation that God would treasure because they would reflect his values of morality, his wisdom to the rest of the nations. Again, if you have a King James Version in the margin next to the word special, you'll see a reference back to Exodus 19 verse 5. In that passage, we read that Israel to, were to be God's peculiar treasure. They were God's special treasure. Why? Well, because they were to be obedient to God's word and to keep God's laws. They would be God's role models to the nation. And then thirdly, in verse 6, they were to be a people above all people upon the face of the earth. The word above doesn't mean that they were to think that they were better human beings than any other race. They were no different to any other people. The word above has more of the idea that they were to set their goals in life to reaching up to heavenly ideals and principles taught to them by God. They were not to become involved in the pursuit of things that were self-satisfying, of self-interest. They were to reach forward and upward to a way of life modelled after godly principles. God set them apart. He selected them. Holy, special, above. He chose them as his people. The words of verse 6 cannot be read in any other way. But Moses, who spoke these words to the nation just before they inherited the land of Israel, wanted them to also understand this, that God's selection was the result of God's gracious choice to establish a relationship with a specific nation for the purpose of bringing salvation to the world. He could have selected any nation, but he selected Israel because of something, they, something that they had no say or control of. Moses goes on to say in verse 7, 
The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in, na in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God's choice of Israel was not based on their size, strength, or even righteousness, but on his love and faithfulness to promises he made to their father Abraham. God's love of the nation of Israel was a direct result of his love of their ancestors, to whom he had made great and precious promises about the future of their nation and the nations of the world. In fact, if we come back a couple of chapters to Deuteronomy 4, we'll notice how clearly Moses makes that point so that the nation realised the great responsibility that God was putting upon them. The selection of Israel as God's nation was solely because of God's interaction with the fathers of Israel. And so Moses speaking to the people concerning God choosing them says in verse 32, For us now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and asked from one side of heaven unto the other, whether there be any, whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is, or hath been heard like it. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard and live? Or hath God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, and by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? God worked miracles, witnessed by the people of Israel, to prove to them that he had chosen them. He brought them out of Egypt, separated the Red Sea so they could march through, showed them evidence of his amazing power for 40 years, all because of his relationship with the nation's ancestors. And then continuing on from verse 36, Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice, that he might instruct thee, and upon earth he showed thee his great fire, and thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them, and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt. God's involvement with the nation of Israel is all to do with the fathers of the nation to whom God made important promises. Now, before we look at these promises and why God gave them, I want to point out to you the important statement that is made in this section of Deuteronomy. So important, it is repeated twice. Remember we saw back in chapter 7 that God chose the nation of Israel to be holy, special and above all other people. The reason God did that, his purpose behind that is explained here. In verse 35, God chose that nation so that they might understand this. That thou mightest know that the Lord... He is God. God chose them and showed his power to them that they might know and believe that there is no other God except for him. And then Moses repeats that to them in verse 39. Know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. God wanted, that, wanted them to know in their heart that he is the God of heaven and earth and that there is no other gods. There is no other divine being but he. And believing that, he wanted to see a faithful response in them. Now, friends, God not only wanted Israel to know that, but he wants us to know that fact. He wants the world to know it. Come with me to Isaiah 43. God chose the nation of Israel to be his nation, not only so that they might come to know the God of the Bible is the one and only God, but he chose that nation to teach, them this, teach that same thing to you and me. That's why the nation exists today. That's why, as Christadelphians, we maintain that God who selected them has not abandoned them or given up on them, no matter how unfaithful they have been to him. Consider these words of Isaiah as he talks about the nation of Israel, in verse 1, But now 
Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the, through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Saviour. Look closely at the information in these verses and the claims that are made. In verse 1, God speaks. But now, thus saith the Lord. God speaks. And what God has to say is for one nation only. God reveals the nation he is addressing by the name that nation was known when it first became a company of people. O Jacob. And then by the name it was ultimately known as O Israel. So God is addressing the nation of Israel and he, and he has three words to say. Thou art mine. God reminds the nation of Israel that they belong to him. He chose them in the very beginning and he proved his love of them by redeeming them from Egypt. He gave them an identity when he named them Israel. He is their God. But Israel as a nation in the days of Isaiah's prophecy had rejected their God and they were going to suffer captivity in Babylon. God had already prophesied concerning this. They were going to be taken to the land of the Chaldeans and as far as that generation were concerned, they would die there. God had already said that they would, they would be there for a generation, 70 years. But what God wanted them to know was that even though as a nation they had abandoned him, even though he would send them into captivity, he had not abandoned them because they were always his chosen people. Whatever happened in the future with this nation, and God here is speaking not only of their captivity in Babylon, but of their future history, whatever they had to endure, God would be there to protect and to deliver them. He would allow them to suffer for their wickedness, but he was committed to their survival as a nation. You'll notice that in verse 2, the terms are all in the future tense. God is not reminding them of past events, even though the language here could be applied to past victories that the nation had experienced. For example, when we read in verse 2 that when the nation would pass through the waters, they would not be overwhelmed, God had protected them many years earlier when Pharaoh, King Pharaoh of Egypt tried to destroy them with his army. God led them through the Red Sea and was saved. These words are relevant to past events but they are also talking about future circumstances. Also, the phrase there in verse 2, the rivers shall not overflow thee, looks back to the time when the nation was able to cross the Jordan River into the promised land. The river was pushed back to allow passage for the nation. So there are echoes here back to past conflicts where Israel miraculously survived attack. But God declares that more, that more conflict is to come, primarily because of Israel's refusal to accept God. The nation was not free from war in its past history, neither would it be free in the future. On the screen there is listed almost every war, conflict or battle that the nation of Israel has, has had to endure from the time of Abraham 4,000 years ago to recent times, 2014. There are over a hundred conflicts that Israel has faced and survived, either by overcoming enemies or outliving its oppressors. In most of these conflicts, Israeli soldiers faced armies with larger numbers and superior weapons, and yet they were able to secure resounding victories. But according to the declaration of God, thus saith the Lord, it survived in the past and it would continue to survive in the future. And it would survive because God declared, Thou art mine. I chose you, Israel. You are my people. Those three words are followed up in verse 3 with three statements that give us the reason why they should survive. No question here that God has selected them as his people. But for what reason, we ask the prophet Isaiah? Well, the answer is in verse 9. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. 
Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, It is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. That is why God chose Israel as his people and his nation. The very same thing he wanted the nation to learn is what he wants the nations, or us, to learn. That the God of the Bible is the only God. There is only one real God. He is the God who chose Israel to be his witnesses, and that he is real, and that he has a purpose with the earth that will be fulfilled. So let's just pause for a moment and ask this question. Yes, it might be true that in the Old Testament that God did choose Israel. He might have made promises to the ancestors about selecting their descendants. But that changed in the New Testament when the Jews put them aside to death by crucifixion. Surely that awful act of murdering the Son of God means that God's involvement with that nation ended. In fact, one particular denomination because of continued Jewish refusal to accept their God, has taken it upon themselves to apply the words of the prophet Isaiah in this chapter to themselves. They are the new witnesses of Jehovah, or as the name of God should be pronounced, Yahweh. That God has chosen them to be his people and has completely severed association with the nation. Well, friends, let's just come back to Deuteronomy 7 for a brief moment before we go to the New Testament, to see that that claim is totally foreign to the teaching of the Bible. In Deuteronomy 7, Moses tells us that God did something that makes it impossible for him to ever relinqu relinquish his involvement with that people. Let's read verse 8 again and notice the important point that, about God choosing Israel. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. God didn't only make a promise, he made an oath to the ancestors of Israel. He wanted the ancestors of Israel to understand the serious commitment he was making with them. He would never go back on his word. The oath of God would be upheld in accordance with God's righteousness. The New Testament endorses the fact that God made a solemn oath to the father of Israel, Abraham. On the screen we have the words of Hebrews 6 where we read, For when God made, prom made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I'll bless thee, and multiplying I'll multiply thee. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. When God made a promise to Abraham that he would be with Abraham's descendants, he confirmed that promise and endorsed it with an oath. The oath was the eternal seal from a God who cannot lie, impossible for him to do so. It was the declaration of eternal commitment by God that he would be the God of Israel. Now that commitment that we have seen clearly stated in the Old Testament is verified in the New Testament. Come with me to Romans chapter 11. And here in Romans 11, let's consider the testimony of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul uses clear and unmistakable language about God's continued involvement with Israel. In verse 1, I say then, have God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. The Apostle Paul asks the question, has God abandoned the Jews? And he asks the question on the background that in Christ, the law of Moses was the background to the Jewish faith 
and was fulfilled and superseded in Jesus. And now believers were to accept the gospel of Christ. On that basis that God was calling on believers to associate with the gospel of Christ, did that mean that God's association with Israel as a nation had ended? The response of the apostle is strong. In the authorised version, we have God forbid, which reflects how strong the translators understood the original Greek to mean. But the literal Greek is absolutely and completely by no means. Inconceivable that God would ever abandon the people of Israel. God made a promise and an oath to the father of the nation, unchangeable. In fact, says Paul, as he continues in verses 2 to 4, even though one of the famous prophets of Israel, Elijah, who was so disgusted with Israel's attitude that he appealed to God to destroy the people, God's response was, No, Elijah, It might seem that the whole nation is disobedient, but I have been working to preserve faithful people. God will not abandon that people. He hath chosen them and made a promise and an oath to continue with them. Furthermore, he continues to work with that nation for the very reason that Isaiah told us he does. That nation is the witness to God's existence and that there is no other divine power in the universe. Look at what we read over the page in verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, or completely by no means. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Will Israel's disobedience to God result in their fall from grace? Will they be abandoned by God? Absolutely and completely, by no means. Remember what we read it back in Isaiah 43. Throughout their history, they are God's witnesses. God is using their unfaithfulness at this present time to show that he continues with them in spite of their attitude to him. To prove to Gentiles, the nations, you and me, that he exists and that we ought to respond to God. Look at what Paul goes on to say in verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. There is a blindness in Israel today. The greater majority of the nation today is ignorant of God's involvement with them. They continue their national existence believing that they have achieved everything by their own means. But that blindness is only in part, writes the Apostle. Following on from where I stopped, the Apostle goes on to explain how that part blindness will be removed until the, t- until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. They will respond to God in the future when Jesus Christ returns to the earth and reveals himself to them. God hasn't abandoned the nation. He has not selected other witnesses. They remain the chosen people of God. The next verse goes on to say that this is the covenant, the promise and the oath that God made. Now, to prove that God is indeed the secret to the miraculous survival of Israel, we could look at several past incidents in the history of the nation. As we saw on that table, there was about 100 of them. But what I want to do is draw your attention to an incident of Israel's recent history. And for that, I'd like you to come to Joel chapter 3. The nation of Israel is in existence today, but its existence as a nation is only recent history. In the year AD 70, the Jews were caused to flee from their land and their city. And for 2,000 years, there was no nation of Israel on the face of the globe. There were Jews because God will never allow his people to be extinguished, but there was no nation of Israel. On May the 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation again in the earth after 2,000 years. And this month, Israel is celebrating the 75th anniversary of their establishment as a nation in the land again. That return is a fact, 
of the fulfilment of Bible prophecy and evidence that God has not given up on that people. And here in Joel chapter 3, we have the prophecy of that event given over 2,500 years ago. Joel chapter 3 verse 1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Joel prophesied that a time would come when the nation would be scattered into all parts of the world and that God would eventually bring them back after many, many years of dispersion. The scattering that Joel is referring to happened in the year AD 70 when the Romans came down and destroyed Jerusalem and sent the Jews fleeing to the four corners of the globe. After that period of dispersion, Joel says that God would bring them back to their land and they would again take possession of not only their land, but also the city of Jerusalem. Notice in verse 1 that there are two events being described. The release of Judah and Jerusalem. Judah refers to the land of Israel. Firstly, the people would be returned to their land, and then secondly, Jerusalem. The city and capital would be recaptured and come into the hands of the Jews. The first part of the prophecy concerning Judah was fulfilled in 1948, when the Jews were granted the right to establish a nation of Israel in the land of Palestine. Firstly, by the declaration of Lord Balfour, written in 1917, and then more recently by the United Nations Resolution 181, passed on November 29, 1947. Six months later, Britain left Palestine and the Jews were able to take possession of their land. The very next day after Israel took possession of the land, on May 15, 1948, six Arab nations declared war on Israel. Their goal was to destroy the nation. But God had declared, his word had been spoken, Israel would not be overwhelmed by its enemies. And Israel came out of that 1948 Arab-Israeli war, the war of independence as it became known, intact and with control of a larger area of land than, that, than what was given to them in the United Nations resolution. Israel miraculously survived the attack, not because of military superiority, they were outnumbered by manpower and military equipment. They survived because God said they would. They survived because God had said in Joel 3 verse 1 that he would bring again the captivity of Judah. He would bring, back, bring the people back to their land and make them a nation again. And God accomplished that against all odds. But it wasn't just the people that would return according to the prophecy. The city of Jerusalem would be freed from foreign occupation. The fulfilment of that statement is more remarkable and more miraculous than what happened in 1948. On June the 5th, 1967, Israel were attacked by the largest and most powerful army of combined Arab nations in its short modern history. On that same day, the Israeli Defence Force coordinated an aerial attack on their biggest threat, Egypt. About 200 aircraft flew from Israel west over the Mediterranean Sea before converging on Egypt from the north. They assaulted 18 airfields and eliminated 90% of the Egyptian Air Force. And because of their success, Israel turned on the air forces of Jordan, Syria and Iraq, and by the end of that day, they had successfully won full control of the skies over the Middle East, and that all but secured their victory. On that same day, Egypt, Egyptian and Israeli forces began fighting on the ground in Egypt due to the Israeli army sending tanks and infantry to the border along with more airstrikes. Egypt fought valiantly, but eventually they called a retreat with severe casualties resulting. Because of this, Israel gained the territory of the Gaza Strip as well as the whole Sinai Peninsula and the east bank of the Suez Canal. Israel sent a warning to Jordan to not enter the war. But Jordan ignored the warning and began shelling West Jerusalem. The Israelis counterattacked, sorry, the Israelis counterattacked, and on June 7, Israeli forces drove the Jordanians out of East Jerusalem and most of the West Bank. On the screen are some of the photos of Israelis capturing the city of Jerusalem. 
As they took control of the old city, they wept and prayed at the Western Wall. Maybe some of them recalled the words of Joel. The last phase of the war happened on June 9th, with Israel attacking its northernmost border with Syria and captured the heavily fortified Golan Heights. Then on June 10, the United Nations broke at a ceasefire and the war came to an end. It was estimated that about 20,000 Arabs lost their lives in the war, whilst only 800 Israelis were killed. The Arab force had approximately 465,000 troops, 2,800 tanks and 900 aircraft. Israel had only 265,000 troops, including reservists, only 1,000 tanks and only 200 aircraft. So how did Israel win? How did an army almost half the size and with only one third of the arsenal defeat the Arab nations? Some say it was pure luck and nothing like this would ever happen again. The Jews would like us to think it was their ingenuity and military skills. But Deuteronomy 7, Isaiah 43 and Joel 3 pinpoint the secret to Israel's miraculous survival. God would redeem the nation from those that seek to enslave them, says Deuteronomy. Israel are God's witnesses to the world. He is their Holy One, their Saviour, wrote Isaiah. I will return the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, said God to Joel. There is no doubt, friends, that God has not abandoned Israel. They are still God's chosen people. So let's come back now to the beginning, to the call of the first father of Israel, Abraham in Genesis 12. Here is the promise and the oath that God made to Abraham concerning the people that would be born of him. Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldees. He was an idolater. But circumstances in his life caused him to challenge his belief in idols. Because of his intense desire to know the truth, God appeared to him and gave him this promise. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. God promised Abram, or Abraham as he was later known, that he would make of him a great nation. That nation is Israel. The Jews might consider themselves to be great, but in no way are they a great nation. Certainly not in the terms of this promise. However, God continues his purpose with that nation to bring them to the destiny of complete greatness. That is why God chose Abraham, chose the nation of Israel, why they will never be destroyed. But God also promised that he would protect them from enemies who might come against them. In verse 3 we read, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. Nations or individuals that bless Israel by supporting the nation will find blessing from God. Nations or individuals that curse Israel by trying to destroy them will be cursed. And we have seen that at play throughout history and more recently in our times. Where is the mighty nation of Egypt of the past? Where is the kingdom of the pharaohs that tried to wipe out the nation by killing all the male babies born? Where is the mighty world empire of Babylon that tried to assimilate Israel into its own culture? Where is the mighty nation of Germany under Hitler that tried to wipe out the Jews with a final solution plan? All the nations that curse Israel will be cursed. Israel will outlive them. God chose their father Abraham and he has developed them into a nation and preserved them from the time when he called Abraham to our current day. God is the secret to the nation of Israel's miraculous survival because he has appointed them as the witness to the world that he exists and that there is no other God but him. And God has been with them so that they might acknowledge God in their survival and respond to him. And God is their God so that we might also believe that God is the reason for their survival. And that's the wonderful thing for us out of this subject. You see, this promise of God to Abraham isn't solely about Israel. We are in this promise. 
In the end of verse 3, God promised that in Abraham shall all families of the earth be blessed. Those seven words are the foundation teaching of the gospel. Come with me now to Galatians chapter 3 as we bring our talk to a close. And let's consider what that means to us. The Apostle Paul quotes the seven words spoken to Abraham and he tells us that those words are the foundation stone of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We read in verse 8 and 9, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ was taught to Abraham. And because he believed it, and because he left everything associated with idolatry, God promised him and made an oath with him that he would be with the nation that would come from Abraham. But the gospel that God preached to Abraham was not only about saving Israel, but also saving all nations. It was about justifying the nations, which means making non-Jews, ourselves, faithful to God. It was a message that would bring blessing to all nations, not just Israel. God made a promise, not just that he would be the God of Israel, but that he would become the God of any person from any nation that became associated with the promises made to Abraham. That if people bless Abraham by embracing the faith of Abraham in the promise of God, then God would protect and guard and save them. Look at the amazing promise to us in this chapter from verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Believing the gospel and being baptised into Jesus Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, will bring us into the scope of being heirs according to the promise. We will share in the blessings of the promise God made to Abraham about the nation that came from him. Now look at verse 29 again and notice the important statement that is made. If we are baptised into Christ, we become part of Abraham's seed. The natural seed of Abraham are the Jews. To them has been promised a kingdom and a future greatness. But God is calling others to be grafted into the hope of Israel. He is calling you and me to see the witness of Israel, believe that God has chosen that nation as his, and respond by believing and being baptised into the gospel of Christ. If we believe that, if we accept Israel as God's witnesses, that he is real, and we allow him to become our God, then God promises to bless us with eternal life in his kingdom on earth. 